Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on food allergy, anaphylaxis, and stock epinephrine in the food service settings. I'm Lori Harada and the Executive Director of Food Allergy Canada, and I have here with me today Dr. Susan Wasserman, allergist and clinical immunologist from McMaster University. She's also the past president of the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and the Asthma, Allergy and Clinical Immunology Society of Ontario. Her research interests extend to peanut allergy and food allergy related anaphylaxis. We're also very pleased to have Beth Ann Dinning with us here today. Beth Ann Dinning is an associate in, Tor in the Toronto office of Bordner Ladner Gervais LLP or BLG. She practices in both the Labor and Employment Group and the Insurance and Tort Liability Group. Beth Ann obtained her law degree from the University of Ottawa and she has a master's degree in public and international affairs from Glendon College, York University. So now I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Wasserman who's going to talk about food allergy management and response with epinephrine. Dr. Wasserman. Thank you very much, Lori. These are my disclosures, which will not affect the content of today's presentation. So what is food allergy? A person with a food allergy has an immune system that mistakenly treats the protein in a particular food as if it is dangerous. The body reacts to the food by having an allergic reaction. How common is food allergy? Current estimates show that up to 7.5% of Canadians are affected by food allergy, which is approximately 2.5 million people. And food allergy is a growing public health issue. It appears to be increasing, especially in children, and no cure exists today. These are the priority food allergens. Peanut, tree nuts, which include almonds, Brazil nuts, cashews, hazelnuts, macadamia nuts, pecans, pine nuts, pistachios, walnuts, as well as milk, egg, sesame, soy, wheat and mustard, and seafood. Seafood consists of fish, including trout and salmon, and shellfish, which are divided into crustaceans and mollusks. Crustaceans include lobster, shrimp and crab, and mollusks are scallops, clams, oysters, and mussels. The common name of the priority allergens listed above, as well as gluten sources, such as wheat, triticale, barley, rye, and oats, and added sulfites must be included on a food label. Food odors. It's the protein in a food that causes an allergic reaction. Food odors do not contain protein, hence the, sm the smell of peanut butter is not dangerous to the peanut allergic individual. If someone smells the food they are allergic to, they may feel anxious or uncomfortable. Airborne proteins. If somebody inhales food proteins that they are allergic to, they may have a reaction. For example, a person with a fish allergy who inhales protein in the steam of cooking fish, where cooking may release the protein, may experience an allergic reaction. The reactions are typically mild, though in rare cases somebody may experience a more severe reaction. These are some other allergens as well which have been associated with anaphylaxis. Insect stings, certain medications, latex rubber, exercise. For some, this involves exercising after eating a specific food, which is usually not a problem until exercise is superimposed on that particular food. So what is anaphylaxis? It's the most serious type of allergic reaction. It can affect different parts of the body. It can happen quickly. It can be life-threatening and immediate treatment is necessary. We tell our patients to think fast and this acronym talks about the different symptoms which may affect the face, airway, stomach and total body. Symptoms can vary between reactions and from individual to individual. Any of the symptoms that you see listed here can appear. 
the most dangerous symptoms are difficulty breathing and a drop in blood pressure, and immediate treatment is necessary. Staying safe. Until a cure is found for anaphylaxis, the keys to remaining safe are avoiding the culprit allergens, wearing medical identification such as a medical alert bracelet, and carrying epinephrine, the first line treatment for anaphylaxis. In addition, people with stinging insect allergy can talk to an allergist to determine if they could benefit from venom immunotherapy or allergy shots to the stinging insect to which they are allergic. What do we know about fatalities from anaphylaxis? There are certain risk factors which have been identified for fatality. Not using epinephrine immediately. Previous allergic reactions, especially if severe. Asthma not under control. And age. Teens and young adults taking more risks in terms of allergen avoidance. But luckily, deaths are rare and preventable, and anaphylaxis can be managed. The main treatment, especially as outpatients, is the EpiPen, which is an epinephrine autoinjector. The 0.3 milligram dosage is for adults and children weighing 30 kilograms or greater, 30 kilograms being 66 pounds. The 0.15 milligram dosage is for children weighing between 15 and 30 kilograms or between 33 and 66 pounds. If you have a child or an individual weighing below these uh, weight constraints, usually it is the smaller dosage 0.15 milligram which is used for these children. This should be discussed further with your physician or allergist. More information is available at the EpiPen website, and it should be noted that in Canada, epinephrine autoinjectors are available as behind-the-counter medication and can be obtained without a prescription. These are the five emergency steps which we counsel patients at risk with. Give epinephrine at the first sign of a reaction. Call 911 or local emergency medical services. Give a second dose of epinephrine as early as five minutes after the first dose if there is no improvement in symptoms. Go to the nearest hospital right away, ideally by ambulance, and stay for observation. Call the emergency contact person who needs to be notified in the event of emergency. So what is stock epinephrine? Stock epinephrine is undesignated epinephrine, usually available as an auto-injector. These are devices that are not prescribed for a particular person and can be used in anaphylactic emergencies. The settings are widespread and may include public places, schools, child care centers, camps, restaurants, and food courts. There are challenges with stock epinephrine, which are noted here. One is access to the proper medication, the cost and the maintenance of the stock, adult and junior doses, the expiry dates on the device, and replacing used devices, training, who provides the training and who receives it, and then, of course, liability concerns, the general public, educators who are administering, and restaurant staff. Where is stock epi already in place? There are certain public places, including St. Hubert Chain of Restaurants in Ontario, Quebec, and New Brunswick, the Bell Centre in Montreal, Quebec, La Ronde Amusement Park in Montreal, Quebec, Jackson Square Mall in Hamilton, Ontario, and more recently, 72 city recreation facilities also in Hamilton, Ontario. It's also in schools. Some school boards, and schools purchase auto-injectors for emergencies involving identified students or unidentified students. For five or more years, the PEI school boards have provided additional auto-injectors to schools based on a particular formula, hence they assign a certain number of devices to the school in question. The EpiPen for Schools is a program offered in the U.S. for schools who stock stock epinephrine. There are also a number of airlines, such as Qantas, British Airways, JetBlue, Virgin, and Jetstar, 
who also keep stock epinephrine on board. Here's an example of a success story where stock epinephrine saved somebody's life. Kelly Dunfield, a Canadian nurse practitioner, led the initiative to secure stock epi in 30 public locations in her town of Sussex, New Brunswick and surrounding regions. An allergy emergency occurred at a wilderness lodge near Sussex. Wellington McLean, 53, was riding an all-terrain vehicle with his family and during that ride he was stung in the face by wasps and had an anaphylactic reaction. Muriel McCallum, a first aid responder, administered the stock epinephrine available at the lodge under the new program. She used the adult device first and then administered the children's dose because McLean needed a second injection. In her own words, if the unit hadn't been there, I would have watched him die. So a valuable lesson. Impact of stock epi. Stock epi can be used for first time reactors as well as when a second dose is required in an identified person. It leads to better outcomes, it reduces the severity of reactions and results in fewer fatalities. Stock epinephrine can help save lives. I'm going to stop there and thank you for your attention and pass over to Beth Ann Dinning to continue. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the legislative or statutory considerations for the provision and use of stock epinephrine. Um, as we'll see over the next few minutes, um, there are very few legislative considerations and actually um, what we have to do is look to some broader um, pieces of legislation and some first principles and attempt to draw some analogies and apply them to the circumstances um, potentially surrounding the use of stock epinephrine. So today we're going to look at sort of two sections and two forms of liability. The first is liability for individuals who, admit, who potentially um, administer stock epinephrine and the second is to look at liability for organizations. Um, so more, more likely the organization such as a, an entity or a private company that's decided to stock, stock epinephrine um, in the event of a reaction. Um, what I'm not going to talk about today um, is criminal law, um, that's sort of a whole other area. What we're talking about today more is civil liability, meaning an individual sues another individual for damages, for money. So as I briefly mentioned at the outset, there currently is no legislation outside of Quebec in Canada dealing specifically with the availability of stock epinephrine, um, which, which leaves us with a little bit of, of guesswork, which of course lawyers don't like at all. <laughs> um, but we look to legislation and case law in these circumstances regarding the administration of emergency first aid, um, such as Good Samaritan legislation. Um, and I will note though that we're not really talking about here um, legislation or the legislative framework applicable to elementary or secondary schools. So for example in Ontario there is Sabrina's Law um, which is very specific to the educational sector. So today I'm looking sort of more broadly at the world outside of schools, um, things like restaurants, um, public spaces, camps and, and some of those different locations that Dr. Wasserman referenced in her presentation. So across virtually every province in Canada, there is something called Good Samaritan legislation, which some of you have probably heard about. Um, almost all provinces and territories in Canada provide statutory, what we call limited liability for individuals, including medical professionals and non-medical professionals, who provide assistance to those requiring immediate medical attention. Uh, the one exception to that is New Brunswick. Um, and then Quebec, as is often the case, has a specific statutory framework, which we'll look at in um, a little bit de of detail uh, in a few moments. Um, Quebec is always a little bit different because it operates using a civil code, so it's a different form of, of um, making law, for lack of a better term, um, in Quebec, and, and so I, I'm only speaking to that in a sort of a limited circumstances of some of their um, code provisions. 
Uh, Good Samaritan legislation will generally apply to medical professionals, which is important so long as they're not acting within their professional capacity. So um, to draw a sort of black and white example, the difference between a doctor providing care in a hospital, um, you know, on shift, uh, versus a doctor providing care when he or she is out at a restaurant for dinner um, with his or her family. Um, What's also important to note is that Good Samaritan legislation, generally speaking, does not provide a positive obligation to provide assistance. Rather, it limits liability to gross negligence. So let me just kind of break down some of those legal terms. Uh, a po it does not provide a positive obligation in that the legislation doesn't say that an individual witnessing an, emer an emergency occurring has to come to that individual's help. Rather, what it does is it says if that individual chooses to provide assistance to someone in an emergency, they're going to provide some protection to them. And that protection is they can only be held civilly liable um, if the manner in which they've administered that first aid uh, is deemed to be grossly negligent. Now, of course, they don't want to make it too easy for us, so they don't def actually define gross negligence in the legislation. And so we're forced to look to various pieces of case law in order to understand what exactly gross negligence means. There isn't any case law that I'm aware of, um, or if there is, it's very, very limited in the context of anaphylaxis or food allergies in defining gross negligence. Um, having said that, um, you can have some peace of mind to know that ultimately it's going to require someone to act um, dramatically to, to sort of provide this care in a dr way that's a dramatic departure from what a reasonable person would do. They would almost have to be acting in, in bad faith in administering um, the assistance uh, in order to, to not have this protection from the legislation. So as mentioned, Good, Samar Good Samaritan legislation in Quebec is slightly different. Um, first of all, it does actually provide a positive obligation on bystanders to help an individual in peril. So Section 2 of Quebec's Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms says that every person must come to the aid of anyone whose life is in peril, um, with you know, the exception of if that's going to put the individual providing the assistance in some form of peril uh, herself. So that's a little bit different in that the expectation in Quebec is that someone will come to someone's assistance and that in my view um, potentially provides a little bit more um, protection for an individual who's providing this assistance because they're acting um, in a must capacity instead of a may capacity. So they have to help so you have to provide them with a certain deference in, in the manner in which they provide that care. Additionally, in Quebec, however, it, it, it has a similar standard for individuals who do provide care. So they're, they're protected unless the, they find that the care that harmed an individual was um, intentionally poor or it was also gross uh, or gross fault, which is sort of similar to gross negligence. So I think what's important, the general, I think, takeaway from these pieces of legislation um, is that the standard for an individual is not perfection. They're not expected to administer this, this care to somebody in peril um, in a manner that is perfect. Um, there might be something that is done improperly or not ideally, and that's not going to necessarily lead to liability for the individual. Also interestingly in Quebec, there's a, a regulation which actually specifically addresses um, stock epinephrine. Um, section 3 of this regulation states that in the absence of a first responder or ambulance technician, any person may administer adrenaline with an auto-injection device to a person in the case of an acute anaphylactic allergic re reaction. So again, it's providing further um, protection or at least further acknowledgement that an individual may undertake this, um, this care. Um, I note, however, that the regulation does not address any liability that may arise where the person suffers injury as a result of the administration of adrenaline. So it says that you can do it, but it doesn't say, and then if something goes wrong, what are the consequences or protections that are afforded to you? So again, we're still dealing with a lot of gaps um, and not a lot of specifics with regards to stock epinephrine um, outside of sort of these first principles from Good Samaritan legislation. 
So secondly, moving to liability for organizations. Um, once again, uh, there is no explicit legislative regime which addresses the provision and supply of stock epinephrine by organizations. Um, other jurisdictions, uh, such as certain states in the U.S., have instituted legislation providing some guidance for uh, supplying stock epinephrine. Um, interestingly, um, I was just sort of reviewing um, an overview of some of this um, in preparation for this presentation. So there are, uh, according to the Network for Public Health in the United States, as of about a year ago, there were 27 states um, in the U.S. that had entity stocking laws. So basically saying that certain entities were um, able to provide stock epinephrine. Most of these organizations, these entities were defined to mean entities where there's a likelihood of there being some sort of anaphylactic incident, I'll call it. Um, so meaning um, arenas, uh, camps, um, restaurants. Um, there's usually separate legislation dealing with educational institutions in the kindergarten to grade 12 age group. Um, but it's very interesting to see the, the United States does appear to be a bit ahead of Canada in this regard. And also, interestingly, there's sort of key pieces um, from each of the legislation, which I've sort of briefly mentioned um, on the slide. So first of all, the definition of entity, what sort of organizations can stock, stock epinephrine is provided. And as I mentioned, these often include recreation camps, sports leagues, amusement parks, sports arenas, or daycare facilities. There's also often training requirements um, required under the pieces of legislation. Um, and then there's liability exemptions provided. So for example, um, exemptions provided where individuals are acting in good faith in administering the stock epinephrine um, will often receive some sort of shield or protection from any form of civil liability. Um, in most Canadian prov provinces, however, the likely risk there is likely a risk if stock epinephrine um, is not is not properly maintained, and that really goes to the next slide, um, which is occupiers' liability. Um, occupiers' liability legislation generally imposes a duty of care upon owners to ensure their premises are reasonably safe for those entering onto the property. And so this exists in, in most provinces across Canada, and I've provided an ex sort of example language from Ontario, which is, I think, um, exemplary of, of the other pieces of legislation. There is no obligation to ensure stock epinephrine is available currently. However, if an organization makes it available, you must ensure that it's reasonably safe and in working order. So I think ultimately what becomes important at this stage without further guidance um, from the legislature is that it's, you know, training is provided, um, it's kept in a, a safe place in accordance with sort of the best practices and the instructions provided by medical practitioners and um, the company producing the stock epinephrine, um, and to sort of review it um, uh, in accordance with, you know, what would be reasonable in the circumstances. So maybe it's every week, maybe it's every month, um, but to sure, ensure it's in working order. In, in uh, the legal profession, we also often like to draw analogies um, where there are holes in legislation. You know, is there anything else out there that exists that we can take as an example, as a best practice, or as providing some guidance for us? And I think in these circumstances, when talking about stock epinephrine, one possible analogy is to the heart defibrillator um, legislation, uh, for example, which exists in Ontario. This legislation expressly states that owners of uh, premises are not shielded from occupiers' liability where they fail to adequately maintain a defibrillator. So basically what it's saying is, you know, that those guidelines that I talked about with the previous slide still apply, and while we're saying that you can um, provide uh, heart defibrillators on site, uh, you're, not, you're not completely waiving your, your obligations as an occupier. Um, again, this isn't applicable in the context of stock epinephrine, um, but it, I think it does provide an interesting, an interesting comparison. So a few just sort of conclusion, um, final, final thoughts and notes. Again, there is no legislative framework currently in place, although some examples may exist in other jurisdictions, such as the United States and to a lesser extent in Quebec. Um, 
legislative protections for individuals who exist in an, uh, who assist in an emergency do exist. Um, and in, in that context, Quebec does have a unique framework providing greater protections, but also requiring Good Samaritans to act in the case of an emergency or in the case of an individual in peril. Occupiers liability legislation does impose a duty of care on organizations um, generally to provide a safe premise when people enter onto it and that would apply in the context of stock epinephrine as it does with um, heart defibrillators. And also it's important to note that while we've looked at some legislation today, there are other areas of the law that would be applicable or would be of note such as criminal law. Um, or, or areas of negligence which would come through more the common law section or, or the courts um, making law not just not just legislation. And so with that, that's my portion of the presentation. So I'll turn things back over to Lori um, to get to the questions. Okay, from a legal perspective, what aspect of carrying stock epinephrine has the greatest risk of liability and if there's a way, like how should one as an organization safeguard themselves? Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, um, first off there are a lot of holes in um, the legal sphere in stock epinephrine. We don't have a lot of specific examples, a lot of case law, so we don't know for certain what a, a court um, would really hone in on in determining what is the standard of care for, for organizations um, supplying stock epinephrine. Having said that, I think what will be important for entities um, to adopt the, the U.S. legislation's language um, to do will be to really conduct their due diligence, which is to speak with um, experts, speak with medical practitioners, speak with organizations um, versed uh, and knowledgeable in the area, and to comply with any sort of um, standard of care provided for by the company that's providing the stock epinephrine. And if you can show that in in, in doing that, you've acted reasonably, provided a reasonably safe premises. Um, I think you've gone a long way to show that you've acted a, a reasonably and not negligently um, in providing the stock epinephrine um, for, you know, for lack of a better term, for public use. So that may require providing training to individuals who are most likely to use it. Um, and like I said, figuring out best practices for storing the stock epinephrine um, and, and inspecting it to ensure that it, it remains safe. Thank you. So another question, it's, it's related, but and I think you mentioned it already, is that someone's asking what laws allowed public access epinephrine to be available. And I think you mentioned there really are no laws. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so that's part of the difficulty that, that we're in right now. We're really taking these general pieces of legislation um, and then trying to take the first principles provided by them um, and then um, adapting them and applying them to this specific circumstance of stock epinephrine. So until there are specific pieces of legislation, there is nothing explicitly permitting the use of stock epinephrine or I guess even encouraging to use a stronger word, um, but there's also nothing prohibiting it. Um, and so we're in a bit of a, a void right now and I know there is, there's more and more discussion about providing more legislative guidelines, but to date we, we don't really have that. Okay, so another one for you, Beth Ann. It may be another gray area, but no, no one issue we have, or sorry, but one issue we have constantly struggled with finding concrete answers to is in the camp or outdoor education setting when taking youth off site for hiking trips or day trips or overnight uh, when there's no known anaphylaxis allergy amongst the participants. Should we still take EpiPens and do we take two? And maybe some of these questions are for Dr. Wasserman as well. Um, what else should we bring? So some of this is really for you and some is probably for Dr. Wasserman. So if you want to address the legal aspect and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. Wasserman. Sure. Um, so, I mean, from a legal perspective, I would, I would say from a, without knowledge of any, um, any allergies, you're not under a legal obligation to bring them with you. I have a feeling Dr. Wasserman will say it's a best practice to do so. Um, and until we've established, you know, it might be interesting even to speak to your um, your 
peers in the industry to see what they're doing um, because ultimately what would happen in a legal context is the uh, court would be asked to determine what is the standard of care of a camp, what, what does a reasonable camp or outdoor um, activities program do? And if the answer is 90% of them bring it with them and the medical evidence is that it's safe to do so and it's reasonable to do so, then a court would likely take that evidence and say, well then a reasonable ca uh, company running a camp should bring those with them. So uh, my, my first in inclination is to figure out what is you know, standard practice in the area uh, and figure out you know, what your um, uh, colleagues are doing and then that might be beneficial. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Dr. Wasserman to kind of speak to the medical um, concerns or benefits of doing that. Thanks very much, Beth Ann. Look, from a medical point of view, uh, I think it's an intelligent public health measure to have epinephrine available in those circumstances. Uh, we teach people that this is not a dangerous drug, there's no downside to administering it, and it's good preparedness, especially when you're far from medical attention. Often these camping trips are in remote areas. There may be somebody with either identified or unidentified food allergy. And in that context, things like insect stings are extremely common and common causes of anaphylaxis. Uh, you know, hiking through the woods, you may step on a nest of something or whatever. So clearly the context of allergy uh, as a medical problem that could arise is there. So I would recommend having it. I see no downside and just very good uh, practice in that situation. Thank you, Dr. Wasserman. And I think this is probably the same person who's asking another extended part of the question, which is in a camp setting, where would you recommend people carry epinephrine? Um, also, and should you carry both sizes and two of each, the junior and adult dose? I would say that depending on the weight and age of individuals that you're dealing with, it's probably a good idea to carry both. If these are mainly teenagers or whatever who generally fall above the weight indication for the, uh, the junior epinephrine auto-injectors, then I'd probably just carry the adult. Two doses, definitely a good idea. Some people may need more than one. And you know, in a camp setting where you have young adults administering the epinephrine, there may be some technical difficulty or whatever, having two devices is always a good idea in case there's a problem administering the first one. Uh, it's important that they not be kept in a hot area, so there'll have to be some cool part of the campsite or some type of uh, uh, provision for keeping these things uh, out of direct sunlight since that's going to directly affect um, whether or not the epinephrine breaks down. So Dr. Wasserman, we have another question for you. So um, in the case of a first time reaction, like whether it's a restaurant or elsewhere, and you're not sure, it looks like it's a severe allergic reaction, anaphylaxis, what should you do? Thanks, Lori. I get that question a lot. And certainty in this business is not always there, especially when you are a first time reactor. So. It's important to sort of know what the typical signs and symptoms are. It takes a bit of judgment. Uh, you make your best judgment and then even when there's doubt, even when you're not certain, I would administer the epinephrine auto injector. So I think it's perfectly reasonable even with a lack of certainty to make your best judgment and to administer under those circumstances. So Dr. Wasserman, we have another question and it's uh, a couple of them are related. I've heard that there is potentially some risk of administering epi if someone has a heart condition. Is it true? Another person's asked um, that you mentioned that the drug is safe. Are there some medical situations where the administration can be harmful to an individual? For example, a senior with heart conditions. Could you just go over some of those risk factors, please? Thank you. Probably the most significant risk factor is cardiac disease. If somebody has a tendency to arrhythmia or very bad uncontrolled hypertension, these would be circumstances where using epinephrine might make you a bit nervous. 
But in spite of that, you have to recognize that if somebody is having anaphylaxis, this is still the life-saving treatment of choice. And in these particular situations, you really do have to have communication with the physician. Some cardiologists will tell you, look, if you need to use it, you use it. But instead of administering the full dosage, perhaps administer half initially and see how the patient does. So really, in the case of anaphylaxis, in spite of the risk, you've got to keep them uh, under consideration and get advice from the physician, but it's still the treatment of choice under those circumstances. Thank you. And some questions for Bethann. So Bethann, someone's asking, I guess they're from a club, and uh, if, there's, if the club has a liability, if they give epinephrine to a member or an employee, do they differ? They're apparently 30 minutes away from a hospital. I think it's similar to some of the questions you've been asked before. Is there, what's the due diligence? So I, I'm not sure what kind of club they don't specify. It could be a golf club, perhaps. Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the liability remains, um, remains similar. Um, as long as a person isn't, for the individual, so long as they don't administer it in a manner that's grossly negligent, um, which again, it provides a good level of protection for individuals administering it, whether it's a member or an employee. Um, you likely have some protection from the um, Good Samaritan Act. Uh, as an institution, as an organization, um, your concern and any liability would most likely arise more so if it wasn't um, provided in a, in a safe manner that's sort of in accordance with the general guidelines provided for stock epinephrine. Um, the last, I guess, the cautionary note to any of this, which is sort of the, this is, I'm definitely a lawyer talking now, is if something goes wrong, nothing ultimately prevents an individual from commencing an action. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong or that you're not protected by the legislation, but that unfortunately is not the threshold for starting legal action. Um, in addition, if stock epinephrine becomes more commonplace, um, to have on in various public uh, sites, such as restaurants or various clubs or camps, um, you could equally be held liable for not having it. Um, if the standard of care becomes that a certain organization should have it, in particular if there um, in the future is, is um, legislation in place um, that is permissive of, for example, restaurants having um, stock epinephrine, um, you could just, and so if someone has an anaphylactic reaction and you don't have stock epinephrine, you could also um, face legal troubles. Um, and so um, all things all things being equal and given the benefits of, of the stock epinephrine that we've heard today, um, you know, having it, uh, stocking stock epinephrine isn't, isn't the only way to face um, potential liability, I guess, is, is my point. Okay. Uh, Beth Ann, another question. I'm not sure if there's any directive around this. I don't think so. What training or signs would be needed to be posted to avoid wrongful use? So, I mean, I can't specifically say what type of training or signs would be required. Um, what I can say, for example, in the United States, under the legislation that I'm aware of, um, in a lot of different, in, in, I, I think it's even in the majority of the states that have applicable legislation, there are certain sort of certified um, training providers or certain criteria for their trainers, and I could um, easily foresee something like that as being part of any legislation in Canada um, moving forward. Um, right now, there there isn't any such guidelines. So again, I think the answer would be. Um, to do some due diligence, um, to talk to organizations in the know or medical practitioners who work in this area um, in order to find some, someone uh, reputable who could provide that type of training um, and advise on the type of, of signage or anything that, that would be prudent or helpful or necessary. Um, and then not just asking, but then following through on whatever those experts' recommendations are. Thank you. Uh, a few questions for Dr. Wasserman. So Dr. Wasserman, someone's asking, in standard first aid certification, it talks about the five rights, it talks about the five rights of medication, using the right dose on the right person, for example, the child EpiPen for a child, adult EpiPen for adult. If we have public access EpiPens and in an emergency we use the adult dose, 
but they need a second dose, would it be okay to use the child dose? Thank you. You saw in that success story slide that that is precisely what happened, that there was an adult dose given to an adult patient with anaphylaxis, followed up with a child's dose because that's all that they had in their possession. So yes, it would be appropriate. Uh, it may be somewhat insufficient in some cases, but overall I would, you know, certainly think that it's fine to do so. No downside, and if it's what you have, it's what you use. So second question is, with stock epi and epinephrine being available to the public, for example, in a university residence or university setting, there is risk of someone taking the EpiPen or the epinephrine and using it on someone not having an allergic reaction. What are the medical and legal risks there? So the first part is medical. I'm going to ask Bethann to answer the second part. So Dr. Wasserman, if you can answer from a medical perspective. Thank you. And I think that a university setting is probably no different than many of the other settings that we've been talking about where one isn't identified, one doesn't know for sure, and yet signs and symptoms look like they may be anaphylaxis. So, you know, universities and food courts and residences, many of, uh, of them do have stock epinephrine. And again, if it's within the reasonable judgment of the person or caregivers or whatever in that situation, that there is anaphylaxis because of compatible signs and symptoms, it's entirely reasonable to give it, uh, especially since there is very little downside to giving it, uh, except in very select circumstances. And I'll pass over to uh, my colleague for further information on the legal aspects. Um, so, I mean, again, we don't entirely know what they what they would would be as we haven't seen these circumstances arise. If someone's using it um, knowing that the person isn't having some sort of anaphylactic reaction um, and is administering it anyway, understanding, you know, what it's for, you're starting to get into the negligent um, administration of the stock epinephrine. Would that rise to the standard of, of gross negligence? You're, you know, we're getting closer. Um, I can't say say for certain um, because, it, but in that circumstance, you're definitely starting to see a something where the individual maybe isn't acting in in good faith to administer it, you know, as a good Samaritan in in a medical emergency situation with an individual in peril. Um, would there be liability for the organization in those circumstances? Um, you know, depending on how they've they've set up where the stock epinephrine is stored, who's managing it, what training has been provided, um, I, I think less so. Um, you know, especially if they can demonstrate that it was put somewhere in 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 good faith. You know, it's in the cafeteria or it's somewhere where it would reasonably be needed, and and the risk of someone using it for alternative purposes um, would would likely um, be outweighed by the the beneficial um, effects of having it in, in such circumstances. Um, but I, I can see, you know, the point that, especially on campuses, people, you know, trying things out or seeing what might happen or something like that. But ultimately, I think you could there'd be a case to be made anyway that the the um, meritorious uh, impact of having it would outweigh any of the um, any of the downside. Thank you. And just to add perspective, Bethann, it's Lori here speaking. Um, when your firm took a look at what's gone on across Canada, you did not find like case law where someone sued someone for trying to help a person in need, did you? Uh, no, there. I mean, there just isn't a lot of that um, that case law out there. There was nothing in the um, anaphylaxis food allergy um, context. There is some um, case law in the under Good Samaritan legislation, but it's very um, limited, and and ultimately, I think, um, uh, la you know, as I sort of referenced before, unfortunately, there's no threshold to commencing a legal action. It doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong, um, and 
but you know there can be um, there might be some cases out there of someone um, you know trying to deal with the impacts of, of something having gone wrong in an emergency situation um, but again that doesn't mean that there was any liability in the circumstances and where we've seen it, we have seen success stories like the one that Dr. Wasserman mentioned, um, and maybe Dr. Wasserman, you can talk to this this next point. People often worry, like when Food Allergy Canada talks to people about stock epinephrine, epinephrine, epinephrine they worry about the what if scenarios, you know, worried that uh, they might give it and it was not needed. But in, in a lot of cases, like people have known histories of food allergies, stinging insects, so there's cause and effect. Uh, often people are still talking when someone's trying to come to the aid of that person. Um, in some cases it could be first time reactions. But again, Dr. Wasserman, if you can go back to the limited downside of given epinephrine and the positive, very positive upside. Thanks, Lori. I think that that's a point that really needs to be emphasized and hopefully we've done so throughout this webinar. There really is very little downside. I think people do have a natural aversion to injections. I see this amongst my patients all the time. They'll wait to see if things are severe enough. They'll use antihistamines initially, even when symptoms are severe, though it should be stated that antihistamines are not the treatment of choice and they take a long time to get going. There's no antihistamine activity that's faster than about half an hour. In the case of epinephrine, it's a few minutes. So very little downside. You don't need certainty. Uh, you have to take your best judgment, especially in the case of stock epinephrine where there may be a first reactor, where you may not be familiar with the individual. And this is why education is so important along with the uh, availability of stock epinephrine in every site. And if in your best judgment, this person appears to be having a severe allergic reaction, uh, then you inject. Uh, the downsides are minimal, rapid heart rate, some shaking. In fact, often patients are talking, you warn them about it. It's a natural side effect of the epinephrine, which really has no long lasting effect on the individual. Thank you. So just a note for our audience, we've got about another few minutes left. So if you still have questions, please submit them now. Um, so the other question that we have, um, and I think we probably just covered this, Dr. Wasman, about the most adverse reacts. Sorry, the ad, the most adverse reactions documented for epinephrine. What would they be? These probably occur in the event of an overdose, when people have received multiple doses of epinephrine, and certainly we've all seen stories like this where they end up inducing an arrhythmia, which is an abnormal, very uh, rapid heart rate. And that's, you know, likely the event of not the, uh, it's not regular dosages of epinephrine that are used in those cases, but overdoses where people have received three and four injections in an emergency room. Uh, often the context is that people, even the physicians, are not entirely certain whether this is anaphylaxis or something else causing the symptoms, but arrhythmia would have to be probably the worst of the adverse events and in that situation. Okay, and uh, Dr. Wasserman, this has come up a couple of times. It's related really to the priority allergens that we talked about. Does coconut fit under tree nut allergy? I've seen it listed there before, but was confused by it. For Health Canada, we know it's not a priority allergen. Can you just speak to this, please? I know there is a bit of confusion around the classification. It's not really a tree nut and sometimes it's listed under seeds or fruits. If it's any consolation, I think I probably have one or two people with coconut allergy and this is in many years of practice. It's just not common. Uh, but anyway, not a tree nut for the most part in our classification. Thank you. I'm not sure who this one's for but the designated first aid providers are not able to provide medication to someone that isn't prescribed to them. So just to clarify, epinephrine in Canada is considered a behind-the-counter medication. So you don't 
need a prescription for it. So it sounds like there's a bit of a quandary if you have some kind of rule that says that as a first aid provider you're not allowed to give medication unless it's prescribed to that specific individual. Bethann, do you want to comment on that first? Um, so, I mean, I guess I'll preface this by saying I'm not entirely familiar with the um, uh, prescribed uh, authority or powers of of all medical professionals and what they are allowed to to do, sort of within the scope of their of their work. Um, what I will say is that the Good Samaritan legislation that I was talking about today applies to medical professionals when they're acting outside of the scope of their of their professional duties. And so, what we're talking about there is is not um, you know a paramedic in an ambulance rushing someone to the hospital and, and their restrictions might be different but what we're talking about more so is you know again to use sort of an easy example but is the paramedic or doctor or some form of medical or paramedical professional who's out for lunch with their family and and witnesses something and stock epinephrine, stock epinephrine um, is available. I don't know if Dr. Wasserman has something to add. Thanks very much. The scope of practice of first responders is probably different across the country and certainly a lot of us remember the days when even ambulances uh, did not always carry epinephrine. But really the concept of stock epinephrine is going to shake up this whole notion that you could only give something to somebody with a designated problem who's had this prescribed before. Because that really is the basis of stock epinephrine. It's for individuals in many cases who have not been identified and who have never had this prescribed. So uh, it is a quandary for now, I agree with you, and I would think that if this does come more and more uh, into practice, then the uh, rules and legalities around who can give and under what circumstances is likely going to change with that. Okay, that's about all the time we have today for our q and I wanted to thank Beth Ann and Dr. Wasserman for their presentations and for you, our audience, for joining us today. We hope that you found the information helpful and useful. Um, if you're interested in educational and instructional videos, go to our website uh, on foodallergycanada.ca. We've also got a portal called allergyaware.ca where you can find courses. These courses are available to the public for free. And it's a great way to get information that's medically sound and very practical. Um, the last thing that I just wanted to mention and remind you is that um, in terms of the content here today, we recommend that if you have councils, you're an organization that's looking to stock epinephrine, please connect with your own legal counsel. Um, if you have medical questions, please contact your own physician. Um, the information was given to, to given today as an overview and for your information. So, and the lastly, again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Pfizer Canada, the Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, the Walter and Maria Schroeder Foundation, and the Peanut Bureau of Canada. Thanks everybody and have a good day.